Hello, my name is Emily Collins and I'm a PhD candidate in Cinema and Media Studies at York University in Toronto. I'm very excited and grateful to be part of the 2023 Interactive Film and Media Annual Conference on Care, Collaboration and Craft. The paper that I'll be presenting is titled Practices of Care and Sites of Resistance in Contemporary Multimedia Multisensory Art. In thinking about what it means to meaningfully resist, I contend that care work is deeply entangled and mutually constitutive in processes and practices of resistance. In the same way that to extend and enact care in our contemporary moment means to unsettle and oppose traditional paradigms and dominant modalities where care work is regularly rendered invisible and undervalued. Resistance and care take shape in expansive and intimate forms, and when registered through sound and listening as modalities of effective material, social, and political relations, can provide new insights, grammars, and epistemologies of 21st century communities of both. Artists like Sonia Boyce in Feeling Her Way, who engage with these sonic modes within the context of social practice art, where interdisciplinary collaboration and relationships are vital, are forging new spaces, opportunities, and notions of care, activism, and collectivity. As the first Black female artist to represent the United Kingdom at the Venice Biennale and winner of the festival's top prize, this paper argues that Boyce embodies a care practice that intimately and intently engages with resistance through an aesthetics of excess the potentiality of polyphony and chorus, and the politics of bearing witness. The discursive explosion of care has seeped into media histories, creative practices, and aesthetic realms, generating insights about how care ethics are embodied and material, prompting us to rethink dominant approaches in contemporary art. Thinking with Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, if care is a triad of labor, ethics, and affect, then the relationship to art is palpable. For Bella Casa, care is about the creation of relations. Quote, in worlds made of heterogeneous forms and processes of life and matter, to care about something or for somebody is inevitably to create relation. End quote. Thinking about practices of care can thus be a way of getting involved with glimpses of alternative livable relationalities with other possible worlds in the making. However, idealizing care as something inherently good or always subversive and emancipatory should be avoided. Because care is ontologically and politically conflicting and contradictory, it can be appropriated and commodified for harmful and violent ends. So rather than positing care as either co-opted or progressive, we must understand care as a situated practice and examine concrete instances of such. As I will argue through a particular case study, the spatial, temporal, and material design of an artwork, as well as its conceptual strategies and speculations, can reconfigure our relationship to the world and our relations with its materialities, histories, voices, modes of listening, and space. Grounding my thinking of sound as relational, dynamic, and embodied is scholarship by Julian Enriquez, Marie Thompson, Amy Goh, and Pedro J.S. Vieira de Oliveira, who discuss the politics of interconnection, reflexivity, and situatedness in sound and listening which is embedded with potential to produce alternative knowledges and disrupt subject-object relations. Albeit in different ways, they argue that the experience of encountering sounds in an environment that might be mediated or abstracted, which can include a museum or gallery setting, cannot divorce the sonic event from its political, social, and material entanglements. Their work recognizes the ideological implications of listening for immersing individual and collective subjects in the world, 
as well as the relational processes that are essential to sonic phenomenon. In thinking sound as an embodied, situated practice, they foster an orientation towards both sound and source, placing emphasis on the stories and narratives from which sound emanates and entangles. In what follows, I hope to demonstrate how Sonia Boyce's work is a form of sonic articulation that does not divorce sound from context and meaning, and in turn is attuned to the political and social matter of sonic events. By focusing on Boyce's use of excess, polyphony, chorus, and bearing witness, I aim to prove how these strategies might advance new critical perspectives on the politics of sound and cultural entanglements of sonic resistance and care in contemporary artwork. The curator of the UK Pavilion in Venice, Emma Ridgway, describes feeling her way in various art historical distinctions. A site-specific installation, an expanded multimedia collage, and an unruly collection, which attests to Sonia Boyce's abundant, decades-long practice that has undergone numerous mutations and experiments in genre and form. Anchoring the installation in the far back room is the devotional collection, an ongoing living archive that evidences the cultural contribution of Black British female musicians to international culture, and includes over a thousand items related to these performers, such as album covers, posters, and other ephemera, evoking notions of collective knowledge building, counter archival practices, and individual subjectivities knotted with public imagination. In the centerpiece, however, Boy stages an experiment in improvisation and vocalization through a series of shifting and evolving audio and video channels featuring five intergenerational Black female musicians, four singers and a composer, as they innovate, collaborate, and play with their voices. On multiple screens, we see that the singers are instructed by the composer to vocalize shrills, screams, murmurs, and humming, together with melodies and chants, which are mounted throughout several open rooms accompanied by gold embellishments, vibrant patchwork wallpaper, and glittery mosaic stills from production day at Abbey Road Studios in London. Both sites, the recording studio and the gallery, are recontextualized here as public performance settings exceeding their usual scope. A private recording space, which is not often video recorded and represented publicly, and the pavilion that is not acoustically designed for sound or listening. In this reconfiguration, the confident, confidential, intimate, and sacred space of the recording studio is opened and offered to audiences, and the gallery space becomes a setting to open one's ears to this multi-sensory installation. Indeed, there is significance in the choice to cite the original performance at Abbey Road Studios for its prestigious status in the history of Western music recording known for defining and expanding the possibilities of what a recording studio is and can be, however primarily steeped in Western white male activities. Boyce usurps and reclaims this space in an art historical context as a black female-led production and in an experiment grounded in improvisation and play. This is also significant within the historical space of the British Pavilion a 19th century neoclassical building originally constructed in 1909 and an emblem of British nationalism. Within this process of recontextualization, the dynamics of their performance and the material space of the artwork are further recast in an aesthetics of excess, of their voices, language, and affect in one sense, and in the materiality of the ostentatious design with flashy and ornate wallpaper and geometric gold trimmings mounted in corners and as seating. On these shiny gold surfaces, the visual and the oral reflect and diffract, rerouting each course of light waves and vibrations and altering audience perceptions of both. The gold structures are crafted to resemble the shape of pyrite, a mineral referred to as fool's gold, a phrase used to signify the misconstrued value of something 
conspicuously used here to gesture towards both the misunderstandings and misrepresentations of value and as a reconstituting and reattributing of value despite its proper worth. In the same way, through these performances, cultural and aesthetic value is reassigned to these women, reflecting Boyce's disruptive practice of finding gold when working outside of circumscribed frameworks. Also illustrative of the oscillating vibrations of sound or the synesthetic imprints often evoked in sonic experiences, the collar style of the wallpaper with intersecting triangles of pink, green, orange, and gold imitates the uncontrollable overflowing movement of sound, merging and overlaying across time and space. Visitors can see themselves reflected in these gold and colorful surfaces, implicating their immersion and making them aware of their presence as audience and witness. A key component of this recontextualization and aesthetics of excess is the immersive but grounded mechanism where spectators are embedded in the environment as immersed subjects within the collective. Gender and performance studies scholar Julian Hernandez argues that to exceed is to trespass and that excess is abundance possessing more than the essential instead of something negative, unnecessary, unproductive, or deviant as neoliberal gazes invested in racial, class, gender, and sexual normativity seek to maintain. An aesthetics of excess, Hernandez postulates, embraces excess where the social political order imposes austerity and determines who is entitled to luxuries as well as what those luxuries can be. To present one's body this way is to make oneself hyper visible, but without the necessity or commitment to gain legibility or legitimacy. Thinking with Hernandez, I extend this framework of excess to sonic terrain. Vocalizations in feeling her way, playful, candid, intimate, unintelligible, subvert how the body usually performs within interpersonal situations governed by social codes. They, voice and the composer included, do not seek to justify themselves as legible or legitimate, but instead present, vocalize, adorn, instruct, and collect in ways that feel good and make sense to them in a practice of reclamation and devotion. The singers elongate and meditate on the words with snarls, growls, gasps, whines, and more, eliciting moments of frenzied mutual elation together in excess and joy. Without language to guide their enunciations, the emphasis shifts to their affective relations and social dynamics. Meaning is inferred otherwise in volume, pitch, tone, and duration which reflects their emotional landscapes and the collective imagination of the group. However, despite the shared elements of the singer's identities, both the oral and visual constituents of the piece denote and sustain difference. In listening, we learn that the musicians Boyce invited have distinctive musical styles, and across the different monitors, we see that they are represented in a filtered, differentiated, colored wash, Papia Juda is in blue, Jackie Dankworth in purple, Sophia Jernberg in orange, Tanya Tickerum in red, and Erlen Wallen in yellow-green. We are made to recognize their differences and distinctions this way, as well as to the dissonance marked by their spirited and diverse vocal interpretations. Their freedom emanates from their polyphonic vocalities in harmony without uniformity. Mikhail Bakhtin's notion of polyphony is instructive here as it invokes the plurality of independent and unmerged voices, which grants agency and validity to their diversity and simultaneity. While Bakhtin uses the term in the context of literary writing to liberate the voices of the characters from straight dictation and authorial expression, it aligns with the conceptual approach here wherein different bodies and voices are empowered in service of an overshadowing narratorial presence. However, the author's creative conception, as Bakhtin posits, which is invariably based on a central theme or idea, 
catalyzes and harmonizes the polyphony. While difference is valued instead of suppressed, accounting for a variety of pluralities and identities that form the collective expression, this dialogic relationship is also between and through the author, composer, or in this case, artist. Especially in this work, where the singularity of each vocalist is deliberately emphasized, in the color-washed color filters and visualized representations, their differences are not flattened but maintained. Centering multivocality is indeed one aspect, but there is also the consideration of the wider group arrangement, its ensemble structure as a chorus. Sadia Hartman celebrates the chorus as an articulation of living free. For Hartman, being in chorus encompasses much more than the composition or choreography. It is always relational and a practice of movement, even though there is nowhere to go. A dance within an enclosure, she says, and a radical form of living otherwise. Hartman states, quote, the chorus is the vehicle for another kind of story, not of the great man or tragic hero, but one in which all modalities play a part, where the headless group incites change, where mutual aid provides the resource for collective action, not leader and mass, where the untranslatable songs and seeming nonsense make good promise of revolution. The chorus propels transformation. It is an incubator of possibility, an assembly sustaining dreams otherwise." End quote. Hartman's perceptive insights communicate the capabilities and synergies of the collective while creating and ensuring space for all modalities of infinite variety. In this piece, Boyce urges for other understandings of community, one that is vocally oriented and sonically approached, where differences arise from within and are cultivated in the sonic collective space that she constructs and allows to flourish. Sounding together becomes a means for unifying in the public sphere, pushing back and asserting the possibility of another order. By invoking the chorus, voice is attentive to the desires and embodiments of freedom and the incessant improvisations for sustaining transgression and joy. By centering the embodied voices and embeddedness of black female musicians and allowing the audience to bear witness through the visualization of their interaction, Boyce participates in the complex process of rewriting, rereading, and resounding history. This approach calls us to consider what the recording and representation of this performance affords otherwise beyond the obvious issues of accessibility and longevity. While listening is often linked to witnessing, which has a long history of entanglement with surveillance, testimony, and truth, and between memory and evocation, here the representation of their performance through images and screens serves as record of enactment and embodiment, where listening facilitates conceptualizations of alternative histories and futurities. Because of this visualization, voice enables audiences to clearly identify the singers as black women, the location of the recording in the historically renowned studio, and the unfolding process of their performances in provocative and indeterminate cues from the composer, all of which have various political implications. In watching their hesitations and ruminations triggered by the call and response structure, we recognize that the singers draw from their lived experiences rather than formal training or aesthetic expectations. Witnessing this unfolding where their vulnerabilities and personalities push through, we come to better comprehend what was entrusted to Boyce to represent with sensitivity and care. Derek Goldman explains how socially engaged art often foregrounds the knowledge of audiences' presence and act of witnessing acknowledging that a substantive event has, has occurred in which all those present are implicated and potentially transformed. In this shift from spectating to witnessing, the audience does not watch voyeuristically in the dark, liberated from accountability or implication. Rather, the audience's conscious act of witnessing is punctuated in the seating arrangements and pyrite reflections 
where we become privileged witnesses to the spectacle of imagination and becoming. Feeling her way emphatically focalizes the politics of performance and inherent relationality of bearing witness as a form of sharing, listening, coexisting, and connection. In this joint commemoration celebration collage, voice motivates us to consider how Black British female musicians are remembered and treated by the cultural industry and audiences. Both projects, the devotional collection and Feeling Her Way, emphasize the overlap and exchange between collective experience, differentiated labor, and embodied forms of care. Voice's approach to the issues of neglected and disregarded histories and epistemologies through an aesthetics of excess, assemblies of polyphony and chorus, and the politics of bearing witness demonstrates how these modes contribute to practices, discourses, and entanglements of resistance and care in contemporary artistic contexts. In awarding voice, the jury of the 59th Venice Biennale said of the installation, quote, Sonia Boyce proposes, consequently, another reading of histories through the sonic. In working collaboratively with other Black women, she impacts a plentitude of silenced stories, end quote. Developing these expansive connections through sound, listening, archival labor, and intimate collaboration is thus a practice of collective world-making rooted in care that challenge our conceptions of resistance and broaden the definition and scope of care work. Thank you.